Morning guys. Well today you asked these questions. These are 10 questions from you my followers that asked me to go in depth or to answer you know how do you do this or whatever. So I decided to do a Q&A for this video to answer your questions. So let me get set up and we're going to answer your questions. Alright guys now that we've got in position got the hammock set up I got your questions let's get started okay Phyllis asks uh, tarp leaks um, I set my tarp up included picture I saw the picture and I went out for a weekend camp out I'm kind of new to this and I, I had the tarp set up and yet leaks were running in and getting me underneath the tarp I got wet during the night what did I do wrong okay uh, setting up a tarp to have it over a hammock or a ground bed. And in this case, Phyllis was at a ground bed. One of the things that you got to be aware of is that when you put up the tarp, how you set it up makes a difference. Let's say, like she did, she went underneath the ridge line and she had the two grommets at the end and there was a pull up in the middle and she just threaded that on. When you pull the tarp tight, you're putting a lot of stress onto the actual tarp, okay? Um, where the corners are and this center patch is, is that the center patch is actually a separate piece of material sandwiched and then sewed all the way around. When you pull that, you're making an opening because sil nylon tarps do not swell up. They do not seal. And so how they seal is they have a, usually a seam tape or some sort of adhesive they use in the industry so that when they sew it, it fills in around the holes that are made for the thread to go through, okay? And since they don't use cotton thread, the thread doesn't swell either. So you have a piece of material, the actual tarp, and a piece of material, and a holes going all the way through them to sew it. And if those holes line up just right due to being pulled or pushed in some direction, water can wick down and come through that. That's the reason I take my tarp and put it over my ridge line and use my, that way I can pull my ridge line very tight. And then I can just simply put the tarp over the top and pull it so it is snug, really snug on either end. I don't like to pull a tarp blood tight because you're going to pull out the grommets. If you get a real heavy downpour just beating on the tarp, it's like you're sitting there jerking on the end of the tarp, on the, the eyelet or whatever that's connected, and to eventually it's going to elongate, stretch, pull out, whatever. And I found that it was just better to have a really tight line for it to lay over and therefore the line is not going to slack up by the beating rain and the tarp then can be a little slacker you know not as blood tight next if you put a tarp up where it is like that where the one connector middle connector and the far connector you'll get valleys during heavy rain between those lift up points as the rain hits on it and the material is forced in under this pressure these can cause pockets that's going to catch and hold water. And this water will then find a way to make your life difficult. Okay, again, flow back to some place that's a sewed seam and drip down, whatever. Uh, let's talk seams a minute. Almost all the silk nylons that I've seen, but I'm sure that you've got one that isn't. Um, if you flip it and look at it, is, is it the same on the top and the bottom? Usually it's not. There's a top where it's a smooth surface with just a sew line. And then there's a bottom where you can see the seam where it was sewed together. You always want those seams facing down underneath the tarp. Otherwise they will catch water. As water is sheeting off of the uh, tarp itself, it can hit that, steer it, and again work down through it. Speed is essential in tarps. You want it set taut enough and steep enough angle so as it, water, as it hydro loads, the water actually hits. Let me define that a little bit more. Hydro loading is when the drain drop hits it, 
it splashes in a 360. That water that is thrown uphill has to then gain gravity back and come back. As it, before it can, the next drop hits, next drop. And so it's a constant uphill fight as well as a downhill fight. And this holds more water on a tarp. It can't get out of the way because the new drop splashing are kind of pushing it back uphill. This is hydro loading. You see it really in huge things, roofs and things like that. Not so much in a tarp, but it can apply when you're in just one of them bucketing downpours. And what it means is that the tarp pushes in from the weight of the water falling on it, the impact, and it being held there by these repeated impacts. It can't sheet off of it. So the size of the tarp need to be relatively steep so it gets on off of there. If you've got a very wide tarp, it holds it more, less gravity effect, see? So her tarp was set a little too far outward. So I'm figuring it was a combination of errors that can cause it. Now, what do you do if you have a hole in a tarp or a pinhole? You figure out, hey, that's it right there. That's where it's leaking. Okay. What I recommend is always, if you think you're going to have bad inclement weather anyway, and you're going to be sleeping under a tarp, have your poncho or rain cover or remember that uh, trash bag that everybody carries in their 10 C's. If I get a drip right here, you know, take the trash bag or the poncho and just drape it over me there so it didn't drape onto me or my bedding and it'll run on off a, another waterproof garment. But make a mental note of right there, by that, da da da, that's where it's leaking. When I get the opportunity, like I get back home or whatever, seam sealer is commonly available and you can get it about any outbacking, backpacking or camping place and treat the tarp the way it says to treat the seams. Most of the time a brand new tarp is usually good for like a year or so, but after that I'll treat it. I've had my one wind tarp now over a year and I will be treating it probably at the end of the summer. It hasn't leaked a bit, but I will just for peace of mind. You know, go through roll every seam to make sure it seals up. If you get a hole in the tarp somewhere due to a snag on the ground or whatever, the simple down and dirty way is take a small square of Gorilla Duct Tape and put it on it on the underside. I call it a, a tarp freckle. I cut it in a circle and stick it on there. Don't do a square because the points of whatever square you make want to lift up and it always hangs stuff. But a circle seems to hold better, at least in my experience. So that's one thing. Also, and you didn't mention this, but I'm going to guess. When the rain is running down the tree, you used, um, I could see in the picture, you used something like mule tape, which is really good and strong. But the problem is the, if it's not a round cord going to the tree, that is more surface area as water is coming down the tree to get onto that line. And you need what's called drip edges. Now, this can only be accomplished by simply a, a piece of cord tied like you know paracord or something tied maybe an inch off the edge of the ridge line on the either side of the tarp so as the water is come down the tree it's wet the ridge line up here and it starts running down the ridge line when it hits that line that's been tied right here it drips so it's a drip line okay make sure you got those on both sides uh, it's not a bad idea if you were doing a hammock to do that on the hammock strap as well, just to ensure you're not going to get any water, you know, running in by your ridge line. Um, if you don't like the duct tape idea for patching your tarp, if you'll go to, uh, I know Walmart carries them, I don't know about other places, but um, I believe they're called skins, and uh, look in the bicycle area where the bicycle tires are. It's usually a small little plastic thing, maybe an inch and a half tall, inch wide, and inside of it, it's got these little bicycle tube patches. They're called, it's green, it's called skins or something like that, and a slime, I think, is the manufacturer of it. Um, you know, like the slime you put in tires to be self-sealing, well, they also make these patches. And I recommend those. I've used them to patch air mattresses. I've patched pools with them. I've patched all kinds of stuff. And they work really well for me. So that might be something you want to look at. And instead of cutting duct tape, use that because it is stretchy. And so therefore, once you get it onto the tarp and the tarp is 
being pulled like we just talked about all these dynamic forces it will stay on the tarp and not pull free because the material that is made up of nylon, silk nylon or any of these other you know co uh, Cuban fiber and etc are all synthetic they're basically plastic you know in some form and therefore they have to be treated a certain way because it can't stretch a big old heavy canvas tarp from back in the day the canvas would actually get wet and the fibers would swell up and seal the hole up but they're heavy to carry I hope that answers your question Phyllis I'm sorry if I went on too long but if that doesn't please contact me back and I'll be happy to do some more okay okay uh, Brian asks about bathing away from the stream, he's concerned about, he's heard that soaps and things, he said, I've seen some pictures and videos of people washing dishes and things like that in the stream and using soap. I understand that's supposed to be bad. What are my thoughts on it? Okay. Um, there are soaps out there like Camp Suds and things like that that are formulated to be as well, less intrusive, less Demetrius than other things, so I would look at that. Two, um, take it away from the, the stream's edge. Um, a trick that we used to do back in the rendezvous days, um, when I was doing rendezvous, uh, was to keep from contaminating the water, is I would go like 20 yards, 15 yards, you know, don't take a long hike, but, you know, don't be at the water's edge. Move uphill significantly, okay? Dig a hole about so big and maybe that deep, and we put a piece of canvas on it. For our modern time, just take that trash bag you're carrying and put it over it and press it down, and then carry water up and pour it into that basin. It'll hold water. And there's your wash basin, and there's a place you can take a bath for you because once you put water in it, and you've got, now you could heat up water in a kettle and add to it and actually heat the water up. If you wanted warm water to wash and bathe with. And when you got done, you just take the piece of the bag and pull up one end slow and let the water run off. And that way it's got time to diffuse back and kind of filter before it gets back to the stream, okay? Um, my Blackbird Haversack will carry water. Um, and I demonstrated that to um, Dan Lutz up in Ohio, that it will actually carry water, and it's going to leak just a little bit at the very points. But I took took it and just simply took everything out of it and dunked it in the stream, and you know had like close to two gallons of water, and was able to walk up and put a fire out that we had done with it by just filling it up and going up and putting the fire out, and then turned upside down and shaking the excess water out of it in just a minute. And I didn't have anything that was going to hurt to get damp, I put inside the bag, you know. But having gotten away from the water's edge, you're not going to contaminate as easily. So, yes, uh, washing pots and pans and stuff like that, especially greases and stuff like that, I recommend to, to spread it out on the ground. Don't put it back in the stream. Uh, if you got something that's particularly greasy, just scoop the water up, take the pan, go uphill sling it so you don't concentrate it someplace, sling it to try to get as big an area as possible and therefore minimize the uh, exact area that's got the contamination. Hope that helps. Okay. Okay. I want to call it tree tracker, okay? I'm sure I'm butchering it, but it, I, I wrote down here in the corner the names of the was down, and tree tracker asked. Uh, from my recent stove uh, video, what stove do I prefer? Because I'd mentioned cartridges and everything else, and I'd set all kinds of stoves. What kind of stove do I prefer? He figured I would carry a wood stove. Um, and we're... Had a little bit of rain for a second. 
I figure he's talking about when he's folding up wood stoves. Those folded up wood stones are very nice wood stoves and would be a very viable option right now. They seem to be a, uh, they've got them down in titanium where they're ultra light, they're small, they're compact. And I live in an area that the ground is just covered with twigs and pine cones and everything else. And so you could very easily do that. What I do if I'm going to have to do something like that, um, I don't like to build a fire unless I've got time to enjoy a fire. Um, to me, a fire is a process where I'm going to clear out an area because I live in dense woods while fire is a thing. Clear out an area and I would drive three tent stakes in the ground, steel tent stakes from a pot would sit on it. And then underneath that, I would build a small twig fire, very quick to heat up, chow, or whatever. Uh, it does the same job as the little folding up set. And then usually by the time I get done eating, it's completely burned out to ash. And then I can just put it out, you know, put water on it, bury it, etc. Instead of carrying the folding stove. Um, but even that is time consuming, getting the material, etc. I like a little trangia. Um, I think it's just quick and handy. Fuel is easily and readily available. And it's something I can very quick and easily... Um, sit out there, fire up, set the pot on it, heat it up in five minutes, uh, put it out, save fuel, etc. It, it, to me, is the best choice for me. I'm sure it's not for you. And a lot of the backpackers will have different ideas. I prefer it over cartridge or canister types, and I've had some of those, and I like those. But once you don't have the cartridge no more, you got nothing, uh, so to speak. If they quit making the cartridges, you don't have anything. Um, whereas alcohol stoves will be burning alcohol forever. I mean, I can I can find alcohol in some way, shape, or form. And even in the, the most backwater little areas, if you've got a little hardware store or some place that sells paint, um, chances are they're going to have alcohol. And so, and it'll be a fuel additive to go into the uh, car, or it will be uh, denatured alcohol in the hardware section. So, you know, it's easy to get, and that's the reason I like the Trangia. It's very efficient, small, and compact. Okay, next question, and this comes from uh, Stephen from the about the cooking series, uh, the cooking videos I've done. He says he's watched all my cooking videos. Do I have a cookbook, or do I have one I would recommend? Uh, yeah, I do, and. I bought it with me, and it's called Camp Cookery for Small Groups. And I'll get up here closer and you can see this. Camp Cookery for Small Groups got off eBay, and it was written for the Boy Scouts. And it's bunches of simple little recipes, easily written in common language, breads, all of it, and gives you a really good overview of how to do this type of cooking. So, no, I do not have a cookbook. Um, do I personally have a list of recipes? In here I do. Um, I had a homemade little book of maybe like 300 recipes that I had done uh, many years ago, and I called it Cooking for Guys. And it, whenever I was a young man and I was, okay, back up. My grandmother, who was the one that basically did a lot of my upbringing, she taught me how to cook early on. And it was our way of spending time together was cooking. And so I learned how to make, you know, fairly complex things at a young age. And so by the time I was a dating age, you know, especially when I had my own place and I was out, Something that we did back in them days, guys, was we'd invite a young lady over for dinner and we'd cook for her. You know, we wanted to show her that we could be more than one trick pony. We were actually pretty good cooks. And um, I had a little book. And a lot of my friends wanted to learn to do this because they were doing that and could I show them how to do it. And it was super simple little recipes, you know, that tasted good, didn't take a lot of prep and that type thing. And I got tired of having to remake that book because I would loan you the book and it would just disappear. 
Oh, I don't know what happened to it. No, you, bright blue notebook about this size, remember? No, it just, and then I had to reconstitute it. And so after a while, I just quit doing it because most of them were up here. And uh, in my cooking series that I've done thus far um, of videos, some of those are a lot of just camp ones that I've learned to do over the years. Um, and I've had really good response from it. And so, uh, based upon this and a couple other things, I'm going to be doing a cooking series. In fact, I just recently got several items to make it a little easier to do a cooking series um, where I can, I hate to waste food. <laughs> um, I want to, I don't want to just cook it and not have somebody there to eat it or me to be able to eat all of it. So I've talked to Mrs. Blackie and we're going to be starting here pretty soon. I'm going to be starting doing a cooking series. So. For lunch or whatever I will cook a something for you guys and pass it on and then that way she and I can have lunch and I ain't made this for nothing you know um, so there is gonna be a cooking series starting very soon so I've got a Pathfinder skillet I've got grill I've got Pathfinder bush pot I've got a canteen cup set and I've got the Pathfinder Canteen Cup set that I've been loaned to do a head-to-head -a -head, um, review on. I'll be using it. And then, of course, I got my Dutch ovens as well. So it's just how elaborate uh, you want to go. Meals for just me uh, are going to be very small and simple. And then you've got, excuse me, more elaborate as we go on until finally Dutch oven cooking. That's the main meal cooker. I can cook, I can bake, I can do anything in a Dutch oven. And if, if I'm going to encourage you to get anything, it's in the Dutch ovens. Once you learn, yeah, it's not a backpacking thing. I'm going to tell you straight up. But for family time, going camping or whatever, it is well worth it once you learn how to use it. And you're going to be cooking on a fire. You can make anything you can make at home in a Dutch oven. Easily. And uh, I've wowed and impressed many friends over the years by throwing it in the back of the truck and taking it to the camp or whatever and being able to pull out a Dutch oven and do um, like smothered and gravy steak with mashed potatoes and uh, baked bread or you know I've done turkey I've done fish I've done just name it you know with 40 years experience doing this yeah you learn how to cook because you like to eat so I got off track now so the question was, cook. Um, no, I do not have a cookbook. But I'm going to be doing the cooking series, uh, starting it back up very shortly, and I will make a new playlist with that. And so, and it'll have, I'll have the list of ingredients and what all you need, and you can just cut and paste that and make you a little notebook from it. How about that? Okay. Uh, Let's see. Trinity asks, Blackie, can you show the figure nine that you mentioned on the improved ridge line? You mentioned that you'd put a figure nine on there for Mrs. Blackie. Could you show that? Okay. Um, the ridge line that I recently did a thing on talking about the toggles an improved ridge line, ridge line that's got the quick connects that are soft shackles now, etc. I mentioned it for Mrs. Blackie. She just doesn't know knots that well. And she can handle every part till you get to the part where you tie it on that end of the tree. And a trucker's knot or whatever, she just doesn't do it enough. And so she just doesn't understand it. So I put a figure nine, and this is hers. And let me show you how I attach the figure nine. Okay the figure nine. All it is is a Prusik. You already know how to hook up the Prusik. And how you attach it is this. There is a hole in a figure nine. These not ease figure nine. Okay. This hole right here. So you're going to tie the Prusik as normal to the line leaving you this loop. What you do is you take the loop, you go through that hole in the figure nine, just like that. 
then pass the whole thing over the figure nine and pull down. Now that's there. Now when you go to hang it up, you go around the tree and the line hooks around this hook first, pull it tight, and then you come back around and go through this hook, and that's what anchors it and bites it. Then it's a simple half inch back here behind it, and that's all you gotta do. So, that's how the figure nine goes on there and works, and I hope that answers your question. If not, just let me know. Okay. Um, Blackie, what do you do in the field to treat smoke in the eyes and the headache that comes from it? Okay. This is actually a very common problem. Um, especially for people who are not used to wood smoke. Now, let us define. Wood smoke from the fire, what the smoke is, is mostly actually steam. And it is a combination of unburnt gases that are coming out of the wood that did not combust in time, you know, because they got out of it before they could combust. And some people have an allergic reaction. Um, some people are simply the smoke hits them and boom, their head plugged up, their eyes are blood red in seconds. And that's, a lot of times it's what kind of wood, if it's pine and things that are real sappy like red pine, you may react to it, or it may be there's a higher water content in the wood you're trying to burn, so there's more smoke, and that smoke is, a, is especially what we used to call acrid. Um, but what to do to treat for it? I recommend, or what I used to carry, was I carry Tylenol sinus, and carry a little bottle of uh, eye drops, uh, designed for when you got pink eye. Okay? Usually, you won't need it, but if you're one of them people that, man, if I, and it just makes your time out here miserable because the wind shifts around, you get a couple of good lungfuls of smoke, and you can't breathe, and you're not asthmatic, but you know what I mean, and you end up with that headache. It's because your sinuses are not used to the smoke, and they're reacting to you breathing in that acrid smoke. So my recommendation is uh, if you truly are having an allergic reaction, course Benadryl um, but what I carried for many years I probably still got some stuck in my pack somewhere was Tylenol sinus it worked for me and carry eye drops because I've had it were times that um, I wasn't just sitting in the smoke but I got a little bit of smoke on me for a minute or two and you know you sit there and squint your eyes and you figure okay it'd be gone in just a minute and for whatever reason, my eyes just reacted to it, and I ended up with bloodshot eyes, and they're just like they they got sand in them again. You know. That's when you need the eye drops to flush your eyes out. Um, I wouldn't recommend you know flushing them out with with the creek water or something because that brings in new problems. So a little teeny bottle of eye drops and Tylenol sinus. Now nature remedy. Uh, there's very little because you're actually reacting to it and I can't give you oh if you go up and do this and this and this because I don't know if you're gonna react to that and I'm sorry um, but I'm sure there are natural remedies for that but it's something that I have not investigated just to be honest with you um, it's just too big a risk to say, you know, use water out of a creek to rinse your eyes out or to take bramble leaves and make tea out of it or something. Um, I would do some research on that uh, if I were you, if it's something you really want to get into. Um, there are people, uh, Ed Gummit. What I would recommend you do is reach out to Jamie Burley on uh, Facebook and one of the uh, Old World Alliance instructors, I can see his face, but to be honest with you right now, I can't call his name, he's an herbal guy. He knows about nature and everything and he would be the one to ask about a nature remedy for that, uh, much more than me. That's, I'm sorry, that's about the best I can tell you, but 
It's Old World Alliance. And just go look up Jamie Burley on uh, Facebook and talk to him. And I think he can hook you up. That'd be the most honest answer I can give you. Okay. This comes from Freedom. And it's one of my older videos where I'm talking about a K-Bar knife. Uh, and he asks, uh, what are your thoughts on mods to K-Bar's big brother? Um, and have I done that? Okay, well, K-Bar's big brother. Uh, the only thing I could figure out when I was doing that is I think he means the bayonet that they've got now. And this is the Marine Corps issue bayonet. So it's sort of like a big K bar. Okay. And for those of you that, you know, okay. The only thing I can figure out that he was talking about was the bayonet they've got now, the Marine Corps bayonet. And this one is a Combat USMC OKC3S Ontario Knife Company issue United States Marine Corps. And what Freedom is talking about is in my video on the K-Bar I talked about how my uncle did showed me how to navigate with a K-Bar using the um, round butt of it to create a use it as a compass and use it as a clock to tell time of day and he had several little modifications like he had put a notch up here in the bottom of the guard so he could put his eye and use the actual edge of the knife as a very fine spotter pointer to look at distant targets for navigation like precisely see that bearing you know type deal what's your landmark way out yonder that type thing well since the bayonet does not have that round uh, thing you could use this oblong or you could use the ring for the bayonet itself and simply put a mark there and use that as a the circle that you need for the compass and the timekeeper you could do that the size of it you could put markings either on the sheath or on it for uh, measurements for creating things in the field it's a good fighting knife but the needs of a uh, combat soldier for a combat weapon, and I, let me say I'm not dissing this. I think that this is an improvement uh, because you finally got a bayonet that's also a knife, that's a good knife, so to speak. It's got all the abilities of the K-Bar, and yet it hooks to the gun itself. So it's got, it's good as a field knife for that. And as a fighting knife, yes, it's a nice big blade. It would not be my first choice for doing woodscraft because it's just the wrong blade design. Uh, you can choke up on it and use the tip for fine work. It's not really a good skinner. It's not really a good carver. It's, But it would not be a bad knife, okay? It would not be my first choice, but it would not be a bad knife. But... If I was going to be in the military and going to talk about what I would do to one of these, that I would be allowed to do to one of these, and that's the question. I don't know if you're allowed to do this stuff, guys. It would, if it was mine, I would put a mark up there and use it for the navigation like we talked about. I would put depth markers on here, measurement markers at every quarter inch, so I would have it be measured when I'm making things, etc., um, I would probably get rid of that sharp back edge. I know it's good in combat, but I would dull it down where I have a place to grip so I could choke up on the blade and use the design a little bit better. I might actually even deepen one of these front scallops in the serrated edge to act like a good hook a little bit. You know, I'd put a 90 degree spine back here on the back. It's pretty close, but it needs to be squared up. So I'd have something for a ferro rod. I would add a ferro rod to my sheath set. That'd be about it. I mean, it's kind of, it's, she's a good fighting knife. She's not a witchcraft knife. She's not a witchcraft knife. But that would be what I would do to it. 
you know, that's just my little two cents. I'm happy that the Marine Corps has finally got a more of a make sense. Um, the Marine Corps fighting knife, the K-Bar, has been steeped in history and is a great fighting tool. It is not a great woods tool. Um, but now they've combined them where you've got an actual usable knife for field work. Um, being able to cut up stuff and carry it and have a usable knife that also fits on the gun, I think is in the right direction instead of having just a, a lot of the bayonets like I played with when I was young that went to the M14, M1 Grand, stuff like that. Yes, you could sharpen them, but they were too thick, too broad, and just, it was like a sharpened chisel. <laughs> it was not a good field knife. Oh, I wouldn't mind batoning with one, you know. Uh, there was a British survival knife that I had back in the 80s. It was actually one of the issue ones. It's got three, you know, big, beefy, chunky blade, and then it's got wooden handles, and then the three big screws, like, went through it. And uh, it's like, like almost a quarter inch thick. And man, you want a baton and knife? That thing's a pro. You, you can nail it into a stump, put a chain around it, and pull the world around. Uh, you couldn't bend it or break it, but it was lousy as a knife. It was good as a splitting wedge, but lousy as a knife. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Diane, Miss Diane asks, where can a new bushcrafter go to get started? She lives in Ohio. Uh, I'm assuming that you're talking about where could you go to actually physically practice, okay? Um, because you said, you know, get started, and you're in Ohio. Well, of course, you got the Pathfinder School is there if you're looking for that, and I would recommend you go attend um, the Pathfinder School, the Camp Craft School. Um, down here in the south, you got Feed the Fire. There's a lot of really good schools out there, but I would also recommend that in getting started, um, you don't have to go anywhere to start the basics. Uh, and I've mentioned this in the past, I would study a topic and get good at a topic. If I was gonna like long distance correspond with you, Diane, and say that um, what skill sets I'd ask you to do, first would be fire. And you can simply get out in a driveway and practice as long as the local ordinance don't get upset, you know, um, on building a fire. And when you want to learn a uh, ferro rod, start with toilet paper. Take a wad of toilet paper, put it down there, and get the technique of getting a strike and getting the sparks where you want. And try pulling it, try pushing it, try holding your hand stiff and pulling it on top of your foot. There are tons of videos out there, and I've got a video on just fire uh, using a ferro rod techniques to get the best sparks. I've got a video on that, and a lot of other people's got some really good videos. So start with that skill. Practice putting up the tarp. If you got a park or something where you can go to locally, or like you said, in the backyard, don't go out there into the wilderness to start when you don't have a basis in the skill. <coughs> and I know from several people who run schools that have talked to me about students showing up with a brand new ferro rod in the plastic, they've never even used it. They've never used a ferro rod, and they're here to basically be put to the test, and they've never held one before. Um, that's, that's a mistake. It's get out there and practice with it. Um, and plus, in Ohio, now, I would recommend go talk to uh, Dan Lutz, L-U-T-Z. You hear me talk about him a lot. Uh, me and him are close friends, and he lives there in Xenia, Ohio. And uh, if you will, Dan, if you will contact Dan, uh, he will know locally places and things like that. I, I can't tell you what park to go to or whatever. I don't live up there. But uh, also I'd recommend go talk to the Boy Scouts. You know, call up and just ask around for scout troops, local scout troops, and talk to the scoutmasters. Where do they go? 
because quite often they don't have a lot of resources either. And so they will know that you can go to this park or you can go to that whatever, this creek, this area, whatever. Usually they have got those scoped out. So I would recommend contacting your local Boy Scout chapters and troops and see if they can give you local pointers of places you can go camp and actually do this locally. Um, I know it's a big challenge depending on what part of the country you're in. And uh, down here in my south, in, here in Alabama, I'm surrounded uh, by forests, national forests, uh, private land, public areas, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's just everywhere for me down here. Uh, I hold my gathering on Geneva State Forest, and that's 7,000 acres, and it's adjacent to like 70,000 acres of national forest that I've got access to. Um, in every state, there is some sort of area or areas. Um, and so I would recommend that A, Boy Scout, B, contact Dan Lutz, C, contact your local game wardens and find out about public land in your state for hunting, camping, fishing, etc. They would be a real good source of that. There's probably a map or something out there just for that. So I'm, that's about the best I can tell you. Good luck to you and I hope you do well. And if there's specific questions on skills and stuff, Dan, please hit me up. Uh, I'm Blackie Thomas on Facebook. Uh, get a hold of me, say hey, it's you, and I will be happy to work with you and uh, on one-on-one -on -one and see if I can give you some pointers or, you know, whatever, or see if I can direct you better than this. And, but thank you for your comment. Uh, okay, elevated beds. Uh, in ground pounding, uh, camping on the ground, and building wilderness shelters, I notice a lot of the channels that are doing this type of thing, they're building elevated beds. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I camped as a ground pounder most of my career. It's only been in the last, well, that's not true. I've hammock camped off and on with it, but uh, sleeping on the ground is something I got a lot of experience with. And like I promised y'all, this fall I will do a ground pounder and series, and I'll talk about tips and tricks for things to do for you guys that sleep on the ground. Uh, elevated bed, as in putting a log at the top, a log at the bottom, and then putting long poles in that you lay on top of. If you have the ability to cut um, those where you're at and not get people upset, yeah, get you up off the ground. Uh, if you can then put a some sort of uh, springy material, insulating material on top, like pine boughs or thatch or broom sage or something like that to get you up a little higher, that's even better because it gives you the opportunity. Make sure I got something sneaking up on me back here. I thought I heard something. Um, then it will get you up off the ground and get you a little more comfort. Um, it's time consuming but it can be worth it. Now down here in my neck of the woods where the ground moves, uh, there's every kind of bugs, creepy crawlies, whatever. Um, everywhere. And so laying on the ground you're going to get crawled on. And so I learned to get off the ground whenever possible or try to limit or minimize that. So if I was going to take the effort to build an elevated bed, I would make an elevated bed. I would get it two feet off the ground. You know. Um, Sean Kelly has done a lot of very good videos about shelter building and that's what I would do. I would simply find a couple of close together trees and put my elevated bed hooked between them where it would be wedged um, tree, tree, outside pole, outside pole, then you put a pole underneath to anchor and keep the outside pole from coming down and you lash it to the tree, lash it to the tree like it's a stretcher and then you'd put cut sticks, poles, the full length of it so that you've got something to get up on and lay off of and then put your tarp over you. Um, I've done that and it's time consuming but I live in an area where look behind me, resources everywhere. I could walk out and just pick out a lot of the, the trash trees of things that are not going to be marketable um, like these big pines are, the pines, the oaks are, but things like the yopon and uh, 
sweet gums and stuff like that are not marketable. So people don't mind as much if you're going to take those. Those are a pioneer street seed that just seems to pop up like weeds. So you can cut it off even with the ground and come back two months later and there's a plant that high sitting there starting to sprout again. Um, so they cope as well. And so using them to make elevated platforms and beds is a fast building material. And not too long ago I showed how to make a, I uh, showed a lashing technique about taking the loop and sticking the poles in and twist, stick the poles in and twist. That's how I made elevated beds and things like that and tables and whatever. It was a simple building technique because all I had to do is make the loop, stick the pole in, twist, stick the pole in, twist, stick the pole in, twist. When I got to this end, I stuck the last pole in. I wound it up and I pulled everything tight, folded over the top and tied it over here. And there was my set. When I got done, I untied it and pull off all of the uh, cords. In fact, I will put a link to that video right here. And so that that's what I would do in an elevated bed. In my case, if I'm gonna build, if I'm gonna take the time to build one, I'm gonna make one at least two feet off the ground. Uh, it's just worth my time. In the winter time, I would make a thatch bed rather than making an elevated bed if I was gonna be ground pounding. Uh, just to get the insulation value because by that point I don't have the bugs and creepy crawlies everywhere. Hope that helps you. Okay, and finally the last one, bear bags. Um, Patrick asked, he said, do we have bears? And I have saw that North Florida has bears, Alabama has bears. You don't mention in your videos about bears and putting bear bags out, etc. Um, I live in an area where we do have black bears, but they're very, very shy and timid, so to speak. Uh, if you spot one, you're lucky. Now, about two hours from me over North Florida, they have a pretty good bear problem. There's so many bears. In fact, uh, just a few years ago, they had a bear hunt, and... Uh, they got over 300 bears in one weekend. That's how many bears were down there. And that's when they're allowing you to get the nuisance bears. You know, the one that gets in your trash can every night, that's the reason they got so many in one night because they knew where these bears were. They weren't afraid of man anymore. But uh, in my area, there are bears that are seen and uh, get killed by cars and things, but it's very, very rare and I've never had a problem with them. Um, and along the ideas of putting up a bear bag, and for those of you that don't know, that's where you take your food stuffs, put it in a bag, go up to, say, 100 yards away from your, where you're going to camp, hang it up in the tree about 10 or 12 feet up, um, tie a rope, throw it over the limb, pull it out there so it's hanging out there to keep your food safe. Well, yes it is and no it ain't, because I got a lot of coons and possums. And uh, I remember an individual at one of the uh, hammock campouts that I attended, oh, back about 2010 or something like that. And the young lady, she was from uh, up north. And so she took and followed the bear etiquette. I mean, she put her stuff into this bag and she threw the thing and everything, hung it in the pine tree about 60, 70 yards away. And uh, the next morning as we're waking up, you know, getting up in camp, and I happened to look down and laugh, there were like three possums. One was hang had done, got into her bag. They had walked out on the limb. One had gone down the rope, was hanging on the bag, and had gnawed a hole in the bag and was dropping food to the other one. Another one was trying to come down the pole. So she went running down there trying to scare off the possums. That it got to her bear bait. So yes, it's safe from the bears, but the coons and the possums will go right up the tree and get to it. So in that case, you want your food closer to you so you can hear it. So it's always a compromise. Um, where you're at, if you have a bear problem, yeah, I would absolutely recommend that. Following that of cooking away from camp, keeping the smells away from camp, etc. But it's the reason I don't focus on it so much is it's just not a problem down here. Well, guys, thank you very much for watching this video. Um, I like to do one of these Q&As every month or so. And if there's any questions that you'd like me to answer in depth like this, please leave them in the comments below, and I'll try to make up a list for next time. Um, I have already said that the uh, sixth run of Blackbirds has shipped. 
the, the uh, next run of blackbirds will probably be in the fall at this time, unless I get a go-ahead from the manufacturer. If so, I will get with you quickly and let you know. Thank all of you for your support on that. And yes, there's some other things in the works coming, and I'll deal with them once I get the opportunity to, to bring it to you. Thank you very much for supporting my channel, and do me a favor, hit that like, share, and subscribe button before you go. Till next time, I'm Blackie, wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.